Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis for Books and Looks. Yes, it's my weekly podcast where I take a look at a book that I've been reading, have an interview with the author, and then take a look at something I've been seeing in the past week. And you know, the summer break is over. That's right. The fall schedule has begun, and we're back and ready to roll with a full slate of <laughs> author interviews up until in December of this year. And I'm very happy to kick off this first episode with a very talented author, by Julia Bryan Thomas. Now, Julia is the wife of another one of our friends, Will Thomas, who's got the Barker and Llewellyn mystery series. Well, let me tell you what, this book is far, far different from that one. And this is one talented writer, I'm going to tell you. Julia joins us today, and she's going to be telling us a little bit about what was the impetus behind this book and the fact that she set it back in the mid-1950s as well as the fact that it takes place in Massachusetts. That's right. The book, if I have not mentioned the title, if you haven't seen it yet, the book is called The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club. That's right. Radcliffe is one of the seven great female colleges in the Northeast. No longer a college, by the way. Very interesting. We get into that, too. But this is a great school. It was right next to Harvard, uh, up in the Cambridge area. And there are these four girls we're going to follow. And she tells us a little bit about her main characters, because there's four first-year freshmen and then the owner of a bookstore. And this isn't a cozy mystery, okay? This isn't your typical bookshop uh, book. This is a real interesting look at the lives of first-year students in the mid-1950s. Dare say you won't find a time now you'll have such a uh, book. In 40 years, they won't be writing about (laughs) college students going to a a reading club. No, those days, I think, are gone. And that's why it's fascinating to to read what the college life was like. She's going to go into that with us. She's going to go into all the problems that the girls have had, their highs and their lows, and I think you're really, really going to enjoy it. So I'm going to sit right back and start recording right now and interviewing my good friend, Julia Bryan Thomas. Welcome to Books and Looks, Julia. Thank you so much, Blaine. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, I have been waiting to have you ever since we had technical problems with Will and your husband, and uh, who was here, and uh, we had a little issue. But you came on and said, hey, I write books, too. And I said, really? And then I said, wow. And I'm so happy we have our first husband and wife people here on uh, people, authors here on uh, Books and Looks. So I've been waiting to, to chat with you for a long while. So Thank you so much. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Get into your background. Where do you come from? What was your education? Did you take creative writing courses? I was born and raised here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to college here as well. I met Will at college, as a matter of fact, at Oklahoma State University. And so we married uh, young and had a family. I always wanted to be a writer. I knew from a very early age because I lived with my grandparents when I was a young child. And when my grandparents moved away to another state, my grandmother knew I was just heartbroken over her leaving. And she said, don't worry, we're writers. We can get through this. And so not only did we write letters, but poems and short stories. She started it. She would write poems and say, write me a poem. And and so... She just kind of grew me as a writer. And of course, by the time I was in school, I was just writing was my favorite thing, reading books as well. So I just always wanted to be associated with books and writing. Wow, that's great. And something that people don't do nowadays is write letters. You had that. You grew up with that. So did I. I always waited to get that weekly letter from my mother when I was in college. So, yeah. It was always a lot of fun. But now that sounds a little bit like the Guernsey Potato Peel Society there. You and she writing back and forth some poems and things like that. We started when I was six or seven and oh my I had kept all the letters that I had from her up until my senior year in high school when she moved back. And after my grandparents both passed away, we discovered she had kept all of my letters as well. So I can go back all the way to seven years old and document the stories that I was telling her and all of those things. So it was just a wonderful experience. After I published my first two books, which were mysteries in 2016 and 2017, I decided that I had no formal 
writing training. And so I applied and was accepted to the Yale Writers Workshop. And so I got to go up and do the summer session at Yale. Wow. And that was very much a bucket list thing, a big dream of mine. And studying in that really intense, you know, 18 hour day writing and environment was just one of the best experiences ever. Wow. Wow, that's really, that's, that's, so you did that over the summertime. Was that one summer or t- multiple summers? One summer, 2019. One summer. I see. Right before COVID. Right before COVID, that's right. right. I was going to say, did they even have it after that for a few years? Well, they didn't have it the next year, and then they went to virtual nah. two years after, so they're back in person they, now. They're back in person, yeah. Hard to do virtually, I, th- I find. I can't. I have a hard time. Uh, you know, they want me to take online classes, and I, I don't do well with that. I like to be right up close and personal with the person. So, wow. Well, that's really great. Well, I'm going to tell you why. You come from a, a great writing family, you and your husband, Will. Uh, very talented family. I got to tell you, you guy, my hat's off to you. I have a wife who loves to cook, and I like to read. So I guess we're, we we don't quite hit you guys. But uh, boy, oh, boy, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Now, you decided that you wanted to... This newest book, which is the Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club, you decided to focus on the first year of college for uh, students. And, and a few questions. Why did you choose 1956 and why Radcliffe? Well, I am obsessed with the 50s. After I had written my first two smaller novels, I had written For Those Who Were Lost, in, which was published in 2022. And I had just done a complete 180 from mysteries to historical fiction. And I I wrote this World War II novel. And during the pandemic, actually, I wrote the rough draft in 90 days. And I know, and it's, it's just done so very well. And whenever I was finished with it, I knew I wanted to write another historical novel. I also knew that I didn't want to be pigeonholed into World War II era writing. And so I thought, what other eras do I love? What do I really, really want to think about and and spend my time in for the next year? And I love the 50s. I love the clothes of the 50s. I love the politics of the 50s. I love just how it was just, they were just on the verge of the women's movement. And there were a lot of changes about to happen. And I thought, I would like to write a book about the cusp of that. And Let it in a setting where I have a bookshop owner and she's got some wisdom to impart, perhaps. And these young girls who are, they think they're so wise and they think they're so old, but really they are coming into things and learning about the world for the first time. So that was just such a pleasure to bring all of those elements together. Yeah, yeah. Well, why Radcliffe? Where did Radcliffe figure? Do you have some connection with the college, or did you? Well, actually, after having spent uh, several weeks at Yale, I thought, well, I'll write a book about it. I just loved it. I loved the experience of living on campus. And as an older student, I should say much older student, I was absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity. And But just for various reasons, it just wasn't a perfect fit for the book. And so I started looking at uh, Radcliffe because I've always been interested in Harvard and and in Radcliffe as well. And the transitions that were going on after World War II there on the campus where they allowed the women to come over and take classes because the men were off at war. And it just geographically as well as emotionally and every other way, it just was a better fit for the story. Now, there are other all-girls schools up in the Northeast. I, are any of them in that same proximity to schools as as Radcliffe was to Harvard? I think it's probably the closest because it's practically yeah. on the campus. And that's one of the things that one of my characters said in the book. She chose Radcliffe because she wouldn't be totally cut off from boys. Right. <laughs> so that was a consideration, I'm wow. sure. Wow. Well, you know, you... you you show these girls getting an informal education and development through a reading club, and that is extremely unique. How did you come upon a reading club to show this formation? Well, I am a big reader, 
one of the things my grandmother also did was send me books. And I remember one of the first ones I got at nine or 10 years old was David Copperfield. So she had me reading serious literature from an early age, and I loved it. I found myself in those books. And really, I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to dive into the literature end of this and make it a literature story as well as a coming-of-age story. So the difficulty with it was that I had to figure out which books to put into the story. So I didn't just want a book about a bookshop where, and you see a million books about bookshops, and they're all about, I love books, so I work at the bookshop, and this thing happens to me, and that thing happens to me. And it's not about how powerful that environment is and how wonderful it is to have the opportunity to learn and grow from literature. And so I really wanted to take, in many cases, very old novels and say, do they still have relevance today? Do they speak to a young woman today or in 1956? And the answer was yes. There is so much to learn about human nature and about womanhood and about life from many, many different books. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you said it all there better than I can. You see so many books that have bookshop, bookshelf, library this, bookshop that, and it's either going to be a cozy mystery or it's going to be some little light little fluff piece. And we don't get that here. And I love you and I applaud you for that. By the way, was this always going to be the title of the book? No, um, it wasn't. My working title was the Cambridge Bookshop. But that while I knew what I was talking about, it just didn't have that dynamic pull. So they gave me a little time to think about it. And I just was so stuck on, you know, it's very hard for an author to say, I have to rename my book. It's just a really difficult thing. And so... My editor said, here's what I think. And I said, I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Do but with my husband's books, you know, he has 14 or 15 now, and he's titled some of them, but everyone in our family has titled some of his other books. So it's a difficult process, and either an editor or a family member can chime in and help you get it right. Yeah, well, this, this I think, is so wonderful. Uh, it, tells, it tells me where it's at, Radcliffe. And it tells me it's a reading club. And I think that's tremendous. And it says it all. And you then use that to delve into these changes that are going to be going on in the girl's life. Now, let's not, we, we've, oh, by the way, this is all, they're all college roommates, aren't they? Or sweet yeah. mates. Yeah. They're sweet mates. That's right. That, that's really neat that we have this happening. And we talk a little bit about nowadays roommates, sweet mates, but now you get these computer forms that you have to push. Do you like this? Do you like that? Do you not like this? Do you not? Do you think we can even have a group of roommates like this nowadays? Maybe not. I mean, everybody's getting to choose what they really want. Yeah. You have a very diverse group of women coming from all over the country. And uh, yeah, the, I think the one story that, that, that we're not going to give anything away here, but the one story that I really appreciated was the one girl coming three days on a bus to get from California to there. Yeah, you know, we, we forget what life was like back then. You know, we forget about that. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about the, the story itself. And you have five main characters. So tell us a little bit about the story, the book, and your characters, because they're all wonderful. All right. So it starts in 1956 with a woman named Alice Campbell. And Alice is divorced. She's about 40. We don't really say exactly how old she is. She's 40 or just a little older. And she has a little money that she's inherited, and she's left a con really controlling husband and wants to start her life over. And so Alice goes to Boston. She rents a pretty ratty little building that nobody wants. It's not on a good street, but she decides this is where my dreams can come true. And so she starts filling it with her favorite books. And... Then she prints a little flyer, and the flyer says that there will be a book club if anyone's interested. And one of the girls happens in, one of my four students happens into the bookshop. She finds it, and she, she takes it back to her sweetmate, and she says, 
this is an excellent extracurricular activity for us. This is something we should do. And she really went to her immediate neighbors because those were the people that they were starting to eat breakfast with and go to class with. And so those are your first friends on your first week or two of college. And she talks everyone into coming. So her name is Tess. Tess comes from Ohio. She's a very good student. She comes from a little bit of bit of a different difficult background and she's very set in her ways she knows what she wants she's bossy and very interesting and then there's evie evie is a farm girl from upstate new york and she has a boyfriend at princeton and she's having her year where she gets to do an independent girl thing and go to college she, like all the others, were good students in high school and had great grades. So this is her opportunity to try living in a more cosmopolitan area and having a different life. And then there's Merritt. Merritt came from San Francisco. She got into Radcliffe, and she wants to be an art major. She has a father. Her mother's passed away, and she's a quiet, interesting one in the group. So she's kind of the, she's the girl next door, but she's also the peacekeeper and she's the one who is looking for common ground with everybody. And the fourth girl, her name is Caroline. And Caroline is from a very wealthy family in Rhode Island. And she's had a great number of privileges that none of the others have ever had. And she's very I want to say almost pushy, but she's she knows her mind in the same way that Tess does, so they will kind of uh, bump heads from time to time. But she changes the dynamic for all of them during their school year. Yeah, yeah. she acts very nonchalant about reading. Oh, I don't really want to read this. Oh, it's too small a print, blah, 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 blah. But, uh, yes, she's a very interesting, very interesting character. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about Radcliffe, we talk about 1956, and, and the dorms. I think that was, you described so many things of dorm life back then. A, where did you research that? And B, tell us a little bit about what dorm life was really like. Well, I did a lot of research about it, and I had contacts at Harvard where I was on the phone with a very nice young man who helped me. I would ask him, how many steps up this staircase, or how many, you know, flights up is this building. So I talked with them extensively, but I also did research about different colleges and different private colleges. And I sort of created my own dream dorm that is kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different things. But there were private schools that had dorms similar to this, where they had dining rooms and, you know, everybody had house mothers, but there was a little bit of freedom, a little bit of elegance and formality to this dorm that it was just a little piece that, that I really wanted to introduce into their lives to make it seem different. Well, it, it was. It was interesting. It was unique. And for those of you who've read it or if you haven't read it, this is one I, I love the fact that they do have all their meals in the dorm. They don't go to a cafeteria like we have nowadays and all the other fancy things we put on college campuses that was in the in their dorm and uh, they had a house mother as you said you had to check in and check out and uh, you couldn't be in after a certain time you know you better be in by 11 o'clock or else <laughs> that's right although they did have keys as some did like i said in private schools where they had a little bit more formal a little bit more elegant situations they had a little bit more freedom so i wrote that into it too it's very interesting that how that differs from what we have now uh, with with college campuses. And, uh, I, I, you know, you're there in the Tulsa area and, and you know, University of Tulsa is a big school, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. And uh, they all fill themselves up with lots of extra things. If we don't have the newest gym, if we don't have the newest rec thing, more dining areas. Not back then, huh? It, was, <laughs> it wasn't like that back then. <laughs> That's correct. And college didn't cost like it does back then either. It's a lot, big difference, big, big difference. But uh, wow, that's, that's I think, a wonderful part of this book, uh, just learning about the uh, dorm life and everything back then. But, you know, the two characters who who I thought we were going to concentrate more on, and they sort of fall away, one, 
As you sort of mentioned, it's Alice. We don't know a lot about Alice. We sort of get little bits about her life. And Tess, I thought this was going to be a focus on Tess. And she falls away also. Now, was that always your intent? Well, actually, no. I Before I ever started writing or, or outlining the book, I, I sit down and I just start to write my story. And I loved Alice, but I knew there were going to be girls. Originally, I thought 10, and then that was just a completely untenable number that was impossible to do. So, But when I finished the synopsis to my agent, she said something funny. She said, oh, my goodness, you're trying to start with one character and end with another character, and I don't know if that can be done. And then she said, if it can be done, you can do it. So I just found my way into the story. There's always, for me, a key into the story. And once I find my way in, I, I'm just going full speed ahead. So one of the characters takes over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in the beginning, it was Tess. I mean, Tess with her drive to get 100. I need 100 on every exam. I got to be two weeks ahead on all my reading. Boom, ba, boom, ba, boom. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, she just sort of, fall by the wayside due to some things that happened to her and and to the other characters and it's a uh, well i'll tell you what it was it's one of the great swerves uh, i i really enjoyed that uh how things changed and you know the other thing is that they took this trip to caroline's house and that i think that made a big change in the family too because she lived up in newport if i'm not mistaken i mean that's right that's right. That was really fun. And I knew when I realized that was coming, I got so excited about it. I couldn't wait to write that chapter. And I feel like that whole chapter is a really pivotal turning point in the book as well, because it shows us really what Caroline is really like, but it also lets the girls have a, a view into her life that they would would not have otherwise have had. Yeah, yeah. Her father, basically a, a loudmouth uh, alcoholic or semi-alcoholic. I don't know if he is or not. Uh, the mother who just is a, a little mouse, a little church mouse, and trying to hide away from the father. And you know, That's right. And Caroline, Caroline was basically sent to college. So it was like an extra year of finishing school. Just go find a really wonderful, rich husband, and then you can start your real life. And that wasn't the life she wanted, but she realized she didn't know what she wanted at all. And she was just doing what everybody expected her to do. And I remember as I was reading this book, because you and I have had a little bit of an email correspondence, I said to you, oh, well, my wife and I have been reading this and we're up to the we're up to the Christmas dance. And then I think my wife went to Romania for two weeks. So I'm sitting here waiting to find out what's going on at the Christmas dance. And it becomes the ultimate Greek tragedy for these girls. I mean, I see the whole thing rising to that point, And then the dance happens. The things happen. Things. Tell us a little bit about the dance. Okay. So Caroline has a boyfriend. His name is Carter. And they are just the most gorgeous couple on the campus. You know how it is at college. There's always a couple that stands out and attracts attention everywhere you go. And in their year, they were the couple. He was a football player, quarterback on the team. And, you know, he gave her his letter jacket and, you know, they're, they're an item. But she's not in love with him. He's just someone attractive to have on her arm basically as a shield to keep her from having to fight off a lot of other people. And so he has expectations that she does not intend to give in to, and she ends up leaving the party uh, angry with him, and they have a big fight, and she leaves. And then she's stuck in a situation that ends up changing her life. Yep. It's a tragic situation and uh, very difficult to read, di difficult to write, I'm assuming. It was. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very. It was. Yep. Absolutely. But I... I knew what was going to happen. Okay. You had you intended that always to be what you wanted to do? That was always like the high point or low point, however you want to call it, of the book. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I knew that Caroline was the vehicle for that story as well. Had to be. So. Had to be. And impossible for Tess to do it because she didn't like going out to anything social and the other ones. Um, Evie, I'm sort of surprised. Evie, eh, she's from a farm area up in New York and- 
does she want to really go back to the farm? Is that what her desire is? Just get back there? I don't think she knows what she wants. She, I think she wants to be married. I think she, um, she did have her eye on a house in the town where uh, she receives a letter from her mother and this house that she'd always admired was up for sale. She wanted the life. She didn't necessarily want the life on the farm, but she wanted to be married and hurry up and get that part of her life settled. And so she gets in a too much of a hurry to try to get that worked out. And then, then she goes home for Christmas and has a high school rival tell her about the, the you know, thing. That was that was an interesting little uh, tidbit there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. She did. She suddenly realizes that the boy she's got, you know, she's stringing along basically uh, has other interests as well, and so she decides she better nail that down quickly. Yep. And that so that that she and did. You, you know, women did that. You <laughs> you know. Some people did that. Yeah. Well, anyway. you know, and that's one of the things I wanted to get to eventually. We'll bring it up now is, you know, eventually all these girls are not coming back for a year two. Was that common that they would go for basically a year and then drop out or go to other colleges? Well, some did. Like I said, if you considered it basically a finishing school, you weren't there to really get an education. And if you didn't know what your major was and something better came along or your parents decided, you know, that's very expensive for a hobby. So that would happen. It was not my intention at the beginning that none of them would return. That's just how it worked out. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that was that was really something. Uh, it's uh, I didn't expect that to happen. I, I, I didn't... Uh, you know, the other thing that I didn't expect, and I don't know if I, and I probably have missed it. It's in there, but I'm sure I missed it. Why exactly did Tess steal a picture of Caroline? I'm not quite sure what that was all about. You know, I think she was she was jealous of her and her opportunities and her life and her beauty. The fact that she was the center of attention, that everything was going to come easy for her. And it was just sheer jealousy which led her to be a little obsessed with her roommate in in a very kind of unha- obviously unhealthy way. And, and which Caroline sort of fosters unknowingly by giving her dresses and sweaters and everything else to make her a little bit more attractive. Yes, she's trying to reach out the, the only way she knows how, um, but it just, it kind of fanned the flames of the envy. Yeah, it did. Really did. It really did. Alice Campbell. She owns a bookstore in Cambridge, and we know. I we know she comes from a had come from a difficult situation. I think uh, her husband, and maybe her parents. I, what tell us a little bit about her background? Well, her parents weren't bad people in any way. It's just that. She married someone who wanted to be very controlling of every little thing, of every dime that was spent, of every move that she made. And when she reached out to her parents, they said, this is what you signed on for. And so many women were told that. So many women in that era and before stayed in marriages that weren't fulfilling or enjoyable to them because they didn't want to disappoint their parents. And yet at a certain point, she just knew that she just couldn't be bullied for the rest of her mm-hmm. life. That's that's what prompted the, I don't know if they were de- separated or divorced, but that's what prompted the break. And then she comes over to the East Coast. And then you introduce once or twice another character and, and a, a lady who comes into the bookstore and becomes a friend to Alice I didn't. I, where does she fit in? I, was she just a, as a friend or what? As a friend, as a friend. And the girls were obviously, the group was kind of breaking up in many ways. And I, I liked leaving Alice with an ally there that she could talk to and talk books with and, you know, be encouraged to start another year of book club with another group of girls. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if Alice is going to have any other non-college people in a, in a book club. I got what was her friend's name? I can't remember. What was her friend's name? Eleanor. Eleanor. That's right. Well, that it's, it's, it was very interesting that, that until that time, the only interaction we saw Alice have was with the four girls, not with anybody else. And 
the four girls sort of grew a little bit from, we don't want anything to drink. Well, we'll have a little bit of water, a little bit of this. And eventually the shocking thing is Caroline has a glass of wine, which she doesn't drink. <laughs> mostly. Right. She doesn't drink. But she did it to, you know, for the outrage factor. Right. And scandalize the other three. <laughs> That's right. Because she was always, she was the cutting edge girl. You know? She was. She just did she whatever was. she wanted. <laughs> Do you have a favorite character out of this book? So it's really funny because sometimes people ask me, did you write yourself into this novel? And I, my answer to that is I'm sort of an, a mix between Tess and Alice that when I was younger, I was the student who was not going to take less than 100% on anything. Everything came second to learning. But as I've gotten older, sharing books and my lover books and my dream life, having that tiny little bookshop that maybe nobody comes into except on a rainy day. It sounds wonderful. But my favorite character was Caroline. And my close second was Merritt. Because I loved Merritt, just her her wonderful, uh, giving, caring personality and how she was there for the others after, you know, the catastrophe hit. Wow. Well, those are the two that my wife and I liked. We liked Caroline and we liked Merritt. We thought they were really good. We thought they were very interesting. And Merritt's another one who sort of grows on you as time goes on. I think her trip home for uh, the Christmas break and then the trip back, and she realizes, I can't take this anymore. And, I, and, and, and yet she finds things from her mother that she maybe had overlooked. And, and I love that, you know. Very good. I love that too. She she found a little painting that her mother had done and put it in her suitcase and brought it back with her. And her father is a, I guess, a world renowned scientist. And he's off to the, the Galapagos, wherever scientists go to do stuff. And so she decides she's going to head back to California. And uh, she has a roommate when she gets there, doesn't she? Huh? That's right. And that was. When I realized that was really going to happen, that was such a pleasure to write. I have to say, there's a scene, and I, I don't want to give too much away, but the scene where one of the characters has a the butler helping her pack her things, and writing that moment, that decisive moment for a young girl, 18, almost 19 years old, just... Knowing her own mind and knowing you have to do what you have to do. I I loved that so, so much. And it was a perfect fit for Merritt as well. Yep. Now, the only nice male character in this book is that butler or chauffeur. He's the only nice guy. Wow. That sort of surprised me. (laughs) Well, there aren't very many men in the story. And they're just a handful. And so it there are some negative experiences uh, in the story, but there there is kind of, I address that kind of at the end of the book where Merritt says to Caroline, are we man haters? And Caroline said, no, of course we're not man haters. When the right man comes along, you'll know. And, and so, but there sometimes so many women get in these situations where they've had oppressive fathers or oppressive boyfriends or negative experiences. And so this was a little bit of a delve into dealing with that sort of thing. So if you want a nice character, there's a wonderful vicar in my previous book. <laughs> okay. It's everybody's favorite character. His name okay. is Peter. All right. We have to get that book. I have to read that one. So many books. So, so many. Just trying to keep up with your husband keeps me <laughs> keeps me going. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a full time job. It it really is. It really is. To, uh, Radcliffe no longer a college, is it? It's gone. That's it's right. Gone. My it's God. Gone. All of those colleges, mostly. I think they're. Yeah, they're mostly. It's been. It's been. It's. I did some research. They say it's now part of Harvard, and it's got its own academic. Great graduate students there, they made it sound like, uh, not undergrads. But is this the way of the world for the all-girl colleges, do you think? Do you think all the all female colleges are dying? They still exist. I, I think there are some people who are interested in it. I think it's a smaller, waning number. People really do enjoy going to co-ed colleges and having a variety of experiences, and especially some of the colleges that are a little farther out 
than others. So I, I do think it's not as popular now. I just look at my alma mater, which is two miles from where I live, a little place called Furman University. And when I was there, uh, it was around 60, 40 male versus female. And now it's around 55, 45 female to male. And there, we're seeing that. And I'm wondering if that's because the women no longer consider private colleges or and they're now all girl colleges are now coming to this co-ed type environment. And uh, it's just a change. I and mean, such huge changes in colleges nowadays. It's uh, it's fascinating. And uh, oh, I'll tell you. I read something on Twitter this week that I thought was disturbing. It was uh, and I can't remember who wrote it, but they were talking about within 10 years, literature uh, won't even be in the top 10 areas of study in English colleges. So you think of England, especially as being extremely literature driven, and yet the STEM uh, STEM is just beating literature over the head. And there's not really a balance. Everything is computers, tech, techie, engineering, and that sort of thing. So you, I just don't want to see the depth of literature and in and programs in college. I know at the University of Tulsa, they dropped uh, some of their liberal arts majors. So many, many cl- colleges are starting to drop some of those programs, and it's it's really heart wrenching. They look at the number of majors in it, and they're seeing them going down seriously. We were in one time maybe. A, uh, an English uh, department would have 40 or 50 majors, and now they're down to three. And you know, we can't rationalize 12 professors for that. And so they try to create other things for the professors to do, and that just doesn't that doesn't seem to work out. What a time we're living in. This week, the uh, story from University of West Virginia cutting their foreign language departments, cutting their creative writing, gone completely. We're going to need new football stadium, and we're going to need new rec facilities. Again, it's just the priority. Uh, it's a shame. No, that drives the money. Uh, you know, football keeps these schools alive, and so that's their priority these days. I know. What did we do before football? I, 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 you know, uh, when, I, when I was there, so again, 71 to 75, we, it was, yeah, we had a football team. They, they, they weren't very good. I think we were one in nine my freshman year, but... You know, it's uh, it, it's just it's not driven by that whole thing. And uh, now there's so much money from television also that you better have something or else they're just going to pass you by. And that's what happens. But, and people uh, are thinking about jobs, too. Yes, yes. You know, they're, yes. they're thinking about how they're, how they're going to make a living when they get out of college. Yeah. The interesting thing is I've had, a, I think, around four or five different authors that I've interviewed that are actually screenwriters and have now switched their focus into writing novels. And they find that it's more, I can't say it's steadier work, but they're enjoying it more without that structure. They have to have episodic, you know, things. And, and of course, right now they wouldn't be even paid at all if you're a screenwriter, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating how many of those people are now moving over into literature and writing that way. And uh, so maybe there's some little bit of hope, but we're not going to get new blood. You know, got to have new blood all the time. Speaking of new blood, what's coming up for Julia Thomas? What's what's the new blood? What's coming out of your brain? What's What are you tapping away on? What's next? Well, I am wor- working in a novel. I'm two-thirds of the way through. It's Ooh. set in Paris in 1960. Okay. And it is a an espionage novel. So... I know. So I'm doing something totally different, but I really love Paris. I love traveling to France. And so it's something that I guess I always plan to set a book there. So I just kind of follow my interests and things. I love England. I loved World War II. That's why I ended up writing a World War II novel, even with a million other World War II novels out there. Yes. But I found a historical event for that one that had never been written about that I could find. That's correct. And so so that was my impetus there. But yes, I'm really excited about moving forward in time. So it comes out in the spring of 2025. Oh my, okay. We have around another, what, 18, 19 months we have to wait. Uh, uh, well, that's a long time. Uh, any idea about bringing these girls back for a reunion for the reading club? 
Everybody's saying that. Do you think we should? I, I think it would be fun to bring them that either a five or a 10 year reunion. You know, it doesn't always work. Uh, case in point, the new John Grisham book coming out in October called The Exchange. He re- he brings back Mitch McDear, who was in The Firm at Abbey. If he, ref- oh yeah, he brings him back. Maybe a one star book. I read it. It's. Bad. Oh, no. Yep. It's oh, not no. good. Not good. Not good. It's, it's very hard to do. Yes. And that I don't want I don't want these girls to fall into that trap. But I think you as a writer could could bring them out of that. But it would be fun to see where these girls are five years, 10 years, because you could put them easily in the mid 60s when the, you know, the, they're burning their bras. I don't know when they were burning bras, 60s or 70s. <laughs> yeah. and, but you could you can move them forward and see how they're all doing because they're so varied in their interests. And it's wonderful. Whatever it is, it's going to be wonderful, whatever you do. I can tell you that much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank very, you. very, very good stuff. Now, the other thing people are wanting me to find out, and uh, we talked just a little bit about this earlier, you're in the Tulsa area. Is it hard to write when it's 110 degrees in Tulsa? It is so hard to write when it's that hot. I do kind of crank the air down sometimes. I try to write in the mornings when I can crank it down a little bit. I definitely am more of a fall writer. I'm coming into my best season right now. So I'm, you know, laying out candles and thinking about throws and pumpkins and it's just so much more soothing to me. A little bit of rain. We've had temperatures up to I think 108 and heat index is up to 118 wow. over That's the past warm. two weeks. So it's been hot, hot. Yes. Yes. And it's I've hard been... to concentrate. Well, that's the thing that the, the the creative juices don't flow when it's that hot. They just uh, you just die. Wow. Well, also when it's too cold. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm obviously I I put my energy into spring and fall for my biggest output. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. And I'll t- and again, we talked about things earlier. I don't want my friends who are listening to the podcast don't don't let this discussion pigeonhole. Julia, as a women's fiction writer, she is a novelist. She writes historical fiction. Yes, there are women involved. But I don't like to see all the women pigeonholed as women's fiction. It gives, I think, a bad connotation to the type of work you're actually doing, Julia. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, you know, I uh, I have a lot of ladies coming on in my fall schedule, and I'm, I'm, I'm in fact, one who's an art historian has written a wonderful historical fiction book and again women's fiction yeah but we're finding out more and more about women than we used to know or what we're and studied about so it makes sense it makes sense it does but anyway the f- friends this is one of the most talented families you're ever going to find we have julia thomas writing her wonderful books we got will there will thomas writing all those barker and llewellyn mysteries they're spectacular all you guys Whew, there's a competition. I'll tell you what, you guys are you guys are the top of the list here. I'll tell you, you're great. Anyway, listen, I appreciate. Thank you so much for coming on, Julian, for spending a few moments with us uh, on Books and Looks. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. All right, friends, we'll be right back in a moment. Well, thank you so much, Julia. What a fun interview that was. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I hope you get her newest book, The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club, because it's a real insightful book, and I I find it wonderful. I don't care if you're a man or woman, a youth, whatever. You're going to enjoy this book one heck of a lot. Anyway, it's time for me to take a look at something. And you know what? I'm going back to Hawaii. Yeah, I'm going back to Hawaii. You know, those fires out there in Maui have been really devastating. We all know that. But in the rush to, well, find fault, and in some cases to bring legal action, everybody is rushing to judgment as to what's caused the fire. Okay? Couldn't be that it just happened to be nature. No, no. Can't be just nature. Nope. Lawsuits have been filed against the Hawaiian Electric uh, Department. Okay, they say, oh, they're, they're, either their equipment was faulty or they didn't do enough to turn off the power or they didn't do other things. But, you know, there's a lot that went on out there that is just coming out now. And before we all rush to judgment, we have to realize there's a lot that needs to be understood about what caused the fire. You know, what caused the fire? You know, what about the fact that 
the, manage, the, the, the emergency management people didn't send out a fire warning as they usually do. They have, they have a whole system of alarms. No, they sent out a note on Facebook. Really? What if those people had lost their electric by that time? What about the fact that eight hours, eight hours, there had been a fire in this non-indigenous grassland in Maui? that the fire department was trying to put out. Yeah, this report just came out the other day. I, I, I can't believe this. Apparently, they battled this fire for like almost eight hours, thought they had put it out, and were told, we need you somewhere else. And the embers from that fire got caught by the wind and started the new conflagration, which led to more devastation. Folks, I don't know who was at fault, but it's not going to bring back the poor people who have died, the people who've lost their property, the people who've had the devastation, who have to live with that day in, day out. But let's not rush to judgment, folks, because I'm looking at that. And, you know, isn't that what our society seems to do all the time? We rush to judgment. We hear something, and that's got to be the reason. But then, wait a minute, something else comes out. Well, that's got to be the reason. Maybe it's a multitude of reasons. And we all know that Mother Nature, yeah, Mother Nature, has a big part to play in this. Well, not only that, some of the laws passed back in the 1870s had a big part to do with this because they allowed the sugar and the pineapple people to cut up the indigenous grass. That's right. The indigenous grass was cut up to plant sugar and pineapple, and that created part of the problem. Oh, yeah, this goes way back, folks. I'm telling you. It's something that we don't want to rush to judge it with, and that's why I've been looking at it. So, folks, take a look at things. Don't make up your mind. Don't call, you know, and don't blame somebody before we know all the facts. And we're a long way from knowing all the facts. So anyway, on behalf of ViewsOnBooks.com, on behalf of Podcast Studio X, on behalf of Books and Looks, this is Blaine DeSantis saying may all your leaves be pages in a book. <laughs>